So this is uh, where we've got to. So we've been through the engage, capture, understand phases. And now the whole point of this is improvement. So what are we working on to, together to identify what to improve? That's the, the point of the co-design. And then thinking about how we're going to do that. So what happens in this phase is that staff, consumers, family and whānau come together, review the learning, so that's reviewing all the, the uh, themes that you've had from your Engage, Capture, Understand, because it's, as we said at the beginning, it's people involved in that process, it's not you going away and doing the engaging, capturing, and then you then doing the understanding separately, it's also what, what are for them the key things coming through. And then you might think about then what are some change ideas, and we'll talk more about this when we get into the quality improvement phase. But what's come through is a key theme that you might like to uh, think about testing. And so that's where it's identifying there about ideas for early testing. So it might be, for example, uh, one like West Coast DHB, they might have a test of change around involving uh, the cultural aspect into their adverse events process, for example, that might be a, a test of change that they decide as their team that they would like to test. So then you already have your project team, so your overarching project team, but what we found with some of the uh, other DHBs, if you're testing, once you get into the quality improvement phase, if you're testing multiple ideas, you might even have smaller groups that are working on aspects of your project, so not expecting everybody to be working on everything. That's what that's meaning about forming small project teams. And then you'll uh, think about creating a, a plan, a testing plan, but this is, this is down the track. I'm just letting you know about um, what's coming. So there are ways that you can identify, because you might have a whole list of 30 different ideas that have come out, so how do you think about prioritising these? And this is just one tool, I think, this, uh, I think this one is called an impact effort matrix, but there are other ones called PIC tools. Um, I can't remember what the PIC stands for, I know it's got kill in there somewhere, but I decided not to use that one for this. So I've chosen the impact effort matrix. So this is about what is high, Im high impact and low effort. So that might be something that you focus on, that's a quick, quick win. And they're, they're quite good, those sort of easy, uh, smaller pieces of work to get engagement so that people can actually see, see that something is happening. You might have ones that you decide as a team that are, are low impact and low effort and that's, that's like, again another, that's a bit of a fill-in but then it's it deciding on what resources that you have, maybe you'd be better off focusing on the ones that have the higher impact. But that's for, for you as your team to decide. And then there are the bigger pieces of work that are high impact but high effort and those are sometimes the sort of across the DHB projects and then you have to decide whether actually that's something that you as a project have the resource to get into or that's something that you're handing to your clinical governance etc. And then the ones that are low effort or high effort but low impact and the, here they've got called those thankless tasks. So actually then it, you don't have to do everything so you'll come up with some change ideas that actually you think you decide as your project group that actually are in those thank, the thankless tasks so actually you decide not to do those. And then we'll be using the model for improvement for our quality improvement phase. So many of you will be familiar with this. So it's the um, asking those three, three key questions about what are we trying to accomplish? How will we know that a change is an improvement? And that's where it's really important that you have your baseline data. Because if you don't have that data in the beginning and things have changed, how will you actually know that they've changed? You might have stories. But as we said, we need a whole picture, not only the qualitative data, but also the quantitative that will help tell the whole picture. And then what change can we make that will result in improvement? And that's just what I've been talking about with those uh, change ideas. And then using the PDSA, the Plan, Do, Study, Act cycle, which is the engine, it's called the engine of the model for improvement, using that, those processes to make... Um, to act out your um, your changes. But again, we'll go into that in more detail for those not familiar with the model for improvement and plan, do, study, act cycles when we meet for our um, quality improvement phase, which will start in February. So again, an important aspect of um, any of this is measurement, which I've talked about um, 
having your baseline data. But as part of the program, we will be having some outcome um, process and balancing measures. So that in, within quality improvement uh, methodology or uh, lingo, that's the, the called a family of measures. And that's just to see, is at a, at a whole system level, is there, an, is, is there an outcome? What is the outcome that we want? What are the process, the steps that are part of that process to get to your outcome? And the balancing measure is actually, are we having unintended consequences somewhere else in the system that we didn't expect? So for example, um, a zero seclusion one, uh, Roz has just gone out of my mind, would be a balancing measure Increased use of medication, in staff, staff assaults. So, by having less seclusion, is that actually meaning more staff assaults? So, it's really important that we look at those unintended consequences. So, we will be thinking about that as we go through this project, and we'll have support of uh, Natalie Horsepool, who's our senior data analyst, to help with, uh, um, with the data side of things. So now I will get on to my final slides. And we're coming to the end of the day. So this is just about next steps. So this is where we all are today. So as Ros mentioned this morning, we've had the two workshops, the one on the 21st of March for the Quality Improvement Network the quality managers, mental health, as well as national quality managers were part of that workshop, as uh, were some consumer advisors. And we, uh, Roz talked us through the key themes came out of that workshop about what people considered the problem is, and then what does good look like. We then held a workshop on the 26th of June for mental health and addiction clinical leaders, uh, um, CDs, dis, uh, DOMs, general managers, uh, who else was there? Our leadership group. And again, similar workshop, which was what, what was the problem? What does good look like? And then we also introduced those concepts of safety one, safety two, restorative, um, resilient healthcare and restorative practice, which you'll probably hear uh, more about as we go along in this <coughs> process. I think there's some interest. A couple of DHBs may well be doing a bit of uh, test of change by looking at restorative practice in the coming months. So then we have a couple of Zooms booked. I haven't sent the invitations out for those. That was one of the plans of getting you to fill out your project teams, and thank you for that. It's not that that's fixed in stone, and I'm, I'm aware that some of you are still doing your performing of your project team. That's just really for me so that I've got a point of contact so that you don't miss out on the information that's circulated about the project. So we've got a couple of Zooms booked for the 17th of October and the 21st of November. Likely we'll do a bit of a refresher, see how you're getting on on your co-design, just do a refresher on the co-design process, and then maybe we'll look at a case study in November, but really to see how you're getting on. The point of those sessions is not just for us to be presenting at you, it's also uh, a chance for you to ask questions. So I would really encourage you to use them and to use us. They're like coaching sessions for, for you, not as I say, not just for us to be presenting material. So even if you're not really used to using Zoom and feeling a little bit shy, I'd encourage you just to speak anyway because by you asking a question, I guarantee that others will have a similar question and others will then learn from, from where, where you're at. So I really encourage you to to use those sessions. So this is just in terms of what's next between now and when we meet again on the 11th and 12th of December. So 11th in Auckland, 12th in Wellington. I think the Wellington one is here again and um, Auckland will be at Eversley Event Centre. So thinking about who is going to be on your team, so some of you have already established that, so that's great. Some of you not quite there yet, so confirming who's going to be part of your project teams. And I know some of you have um, committed to have those conversations back at your DHB to confirm who's actually going to be your project lead, for instance, so that's great. Thank you for that. Then you'll be thinking about your elevator pitch and then um, getting that really succinct. How are you going to engage people to be part of your co-design process? 
and then thinking about informed consent and the koha along with that. Thinking about how you're going to plan and do your engage, capture and understand. And as Dion said, it doesn't have to be a, a big ta-da, it can just be those two minute conversations that you, you capture somebody at a clinic for instance or wherever it is in the community, um, so it doesn't have to be big and involved. We haven't talked much about this, your project charter, but it is in your pack as an example. I think I put the one in that I've written for our uh, project as a, a national project, just as for you as an example. So you can start documenting that and I'll send you out a soft copy template because in it you'll have who's on your project team, um, what is your aim when, when you get there, when you establish that. So it's just a really useful document for then for you to be, if anybody asks you about your project, what, what are you doing, why are you doing it, just to have it all in one place. And then participating in the Zooms that I've mentioned, and this is all leading up to the co-design workshops coming up on the 11th and 12th of December. So what we'll do is, for those not familiar with storyboards, we found these really useful. It's just a, a I don't know, it's a storyboard, just means, yes, you're telling a story of where you're at, and I'll send you a template, and it's, it's one slide per um, thing, so what maybe one slide for your project team, one slide for your co-design themes, one slide for your change ideas, and then any, um, any learning that you've had that you think would be really useful for other teams, what are your challenges, what worked really well, and then what we do is we um, print those out and stick them up around the room, and then you all have, all have a chance to share with the others where, where you're at with your project. So that's your project team, thank you, I think I've collected all of those. So now the final piece of homework for you to do, and then we'll finish, is uh, your evaluation form. So that's really useful for us to hear back from you about what worked well, what could be improved, and any other comments. So that'll be in your um, Manila folder pack. You could just take uh, five minutes to do that, and then when we've had about five minutes, I'll ask um, Joanne to come and close our meeting for us. Thanks, you.